can you hear me? Cool. Hi, uh, I'm Thibaut, and this is Bogdan. Uh, we are both software engineers at uh, YouTube. We work on the YouTube.com website. Uh, as you might know, YouTube is one of the largest Python deployments uh, in the world, and you have Python. Python has been used very early on in the history of YouTube, and various techniques have been used uh, over the time to ensure that things work as smoothly and as efficiently as possible at that scale. So today we're going to zoom on, um, on two techniques we are using and how you guys can also use them to, uh, like in your projects. The first aspect we'll start with is template rendering. Uh, so when you render youtube.com or another web page, from a very high level perspective, what you do is to first make an RPC, collect all the data that you're going to want to render, and then uh, feed that to, in general, a templating engine, which is going to render the final page. So if we take the, if we start with an example, if we take the example of the PyCon schedule page that we have here, uh, we display a, a table with the list of sessions and their schedules. As the schedule grows, maintaining that HTML template uh, by hand becomes very tedious and error prone. And also, it kind of feels weird because anyhow, the data is still somewhere in a database, right? So this is when template engines uh, come to the rescue. So you might have seen that kind of syntax here. This is the syntax that Django uses. Does anyone use Django here? Yeah, cool. So as you can see here, uh, that's the syntax that basically Django will provide you with, right? So you define a dictionary of display variables, you pass it to the template, and then you render your page. Uh, of course, you use these templates not only to render the, page, the web pages, but you also use this, this template language to, for example, generate email for like, if you take the example of uh, the, the, the conference today for a registration campaign email, you can also use these templates to generate a very large CSV or like pro even provide an XML version of your data if you have an API that you want to expose. Uh, one thing to know as you're building your app is that there is a wide range of options to choose for template engines and how much land logic you're going to embed in your templates. On one side of your, on the spectrum, uh, you have the string.template, right? It's very, it's very simple, very efficient. You create a string, you prepare some placeholders, and then you do a substitution to get your final result. It's very simple, efficient, and also quite powerful because when you do that, you're usually very close to your Python code, so you have all the Python methods available right there. And you can just uh, render things during the substitution phase. However, of course, as things grow, uh, you will probably need to do more and more advanced uh, things. For example, Again, in the example of the PyCon schedule page, you'll need to iterate over multiple rows. So you could start and try to do that by concatenating multiple templates, uh, but pretty soon you, have a, you end up with like a mix of like uh, HTML fragments and Python code, which becomes very hard to read and review. So that would be very easy. It would be very easy here for like either the author of the code or even the reviewer to miss that there could be like a missing closing tag there. This is where templates such as Jinja2 or like the Django engine uh, can be used. What they'll do is that they'll, create they'll allow you to create templates using an engine-specific grammar, right? And you'll have like a specific vocabulary for common tasks such as loops or if conditions. One limitation of these templates, though, is that as you grow and as you onboard new, uh, new engineers, you also have to have them learn that new and specific grammar. And also, while some things might look a bit like a classic Python idiom here, uh, some uh, methods such as like enumerate or, or length are not available with the same, uh, with the same words. So, so it can be tricky. So like, oh, another thing is that everything has to be pre-computed before the rendering. Uh, so it has, everything has to be pre-computed in one Python file before being passed to the render, to the render template. Uh, including some stuff which are a bit weird to pre-compute. Like for example, if you want to have all the absolute URLs of your assets, CSS, JavaScript, and all that, they would have to be pre-computed there if you wanted to have like uh, a method to generate absolute URLs based on your application configuration. So 
since Python is like a scripting language, what about using scripting directly in the templates? Well, this is an area where other templating languages such as Mako and Spitfire shine. Mako is the templating language used by Reddit, and Spitfire is the templating language used by YouTube. Uh, it has been developed uh, at YouTube and has, has now been completely open sourced. It has been available for the developer community for a very long time and has been maintained for over a decade. So it's used uh, to render all the web pages that you have when you go on YouTube.com. So both of these languages are inspired by a common ancestor called Cheetah, one of the very early templating engines. Uh, what they do is that they allow developers to use like a Python-like syntax in their templates. And there is absolutely no, almost nothing new to learn. In, the, in that example, for example, if you want to have an alternating row, a developer will intuitively use like a modulo 2, for example, uh, operand to like select a class every other row. So it's just like Python. In Django, you don't have to learn that this can be done using like cycle uh, even odd, um, uh, that cycle even odd operator. The other advantage is that regular Python functions can be called directly from there. You can, for example, if you have like a formatting method that you use pretty often, you can create it in pure Python, reuse it everywhere in your code, you do regular testing tool belt to ensure coverage, and call it from your speed template. There is no risk of duplication of the logic, everything is Python. Same with the example here, with like a, so in that factory URL that we had. Uh, and if you want to add another CSS file to your page, you don't need to pre-compute that in another Python file. You can just add that uh, additional uh, CSS instructions right here. No need to create a new display variable. So these templates can be used billions of times a day. And again, while most of the server time in your response will be spent uh, pre-computing RPCs and aggregating the data, so want to try to shave any processing time that you can find to free up your workers and handle the next request. And you also want to reduce the execution time of your code if you're using cloud functions. So how do these various template engines compare in terms of performance? Do you have to pay a penalty for running Python uh, like in the last two examples? Well, the answer is no. There is no penalty hit. These engines were optimized for speed of execution. The benchmark that we display here um, the rendering of a very large table pure HTML. Um, of course, you have to take it with a grain of salt, right? In Spitfire uh, or Mako, you have the ability to execute Python. And if you, execute, if you do a, an RPC in the middle of your rendering logic, of course, things are going to be slow. But that's, that would be a, something that you would want to avoid. So we see that, as expected, concatenating all your va variables um, to generate a string is the, is the fastest thing you can get. It's, uh, it's the upper limit of the performance. But engines such as Spitfire and Mako perform almost as well uh, in the benchmarks uh, as hand-coded Python. So to sum up, uh, those templates get a lot of get queue a lot of things to scale up your application. You can scale code a language that your developers already know. You can scale by reusing methods not only in your code but also in your templates. And of course, you can scale performance. If you're curious to know how that performance is achieved, uh, this is actually through an intermediary step of compilation, which converts your template to a pure Python class uh, and then leverages Python bytecode. So for example, if you take the template here where I have my, the functions to define uh, one of my row in, in, uh, in the template, That function gets converted uh, to an intermediary class, which is pure Python. Don't be afraid by that class. You're actually never going to, to read that file. It's just to, to explain you what happens under the hood. But what you see is that uh, w what we're doing is basically appending everything to a buffer. And it's almost like if you had encoded your template. Uh, and that's why you get really close to like, the performances of the encoded uh, append and extend list. What you also see is that we <coughs> add a draw row class in the previous example in the, in the Spitfire, and that draw row class gets also exposed there. Uh, also, under the hood, you have a bunch of like, optimization that, has, that have been done everywhere they could be, so that like, appending to that buffer is as efficient as possible. 
Um, so that's why you get to those very, very, very good performance. That's, that's how you get those very good performances. Uh, so how can you use it in your projects? Well, what you would do is like create that template, save it to like a Spitfire file, and then use that file uh, directly in your Python code. Of course, you could inline that template here, but that's like if you have a large template, it's not very convenient to have all that text uh, in Python code. And you just pass your uh, rendering variables, and you get the final result. So if you're using Django, uh, you can also use these, uh, these, uh, these engines. Um, basically, you can uh, swap the default backend with a custom backend. Django uh, asks you to create uh, a subclass of the base engine to implement get template and from string. It's two very easy methods to implement. Um, and also, uh, you can have many of these custom adapters already written for you. Uh, and available online at the other address here. So the project is, it's a bit small, but it's like github slash youtube slash speedfire. Uh, you can use it in your project. talk a little bit about not templating. Whoops. So uh, a lot of us here use Python because it's, it's fun. And it's like a great developer experience. Um, but sometimes Python gets a little slow, especially when you're doing heavy computational work or you're doing like really the kind of the small critical pieces of your like service that sometimes can get a little bit heavy. Lots of like tra tree traversals, like mapping, like some really complex data mutation. Um, so Really, this kind of talk is about kind of identifying these bottlenecks and figuring out a way to solve them to speed up Python and just to be able to maintain the Python ecosystem but being able to like still have like optimal performance. Um, so for these pieces, we're going to call into C. Uh, so back in the day, you know, this Python extensions have been around for a very long time. You can just write up write C and then like write an extension to like call it in from Python. And then on top of this, people have built Swig. So is also another example. I think someone has talked about it so far. There's also PyBind, Boost, Cython, if you want to just compile your Python to see. And then today I'm going to talk about one that's been developed at Google called Cliff, which is kind of a similar to Swig, and, but it does offer more of a lightweight approach to building um, like the bridge between C++ and Python. So what is, what is Cliff? Uh, Cliff is designed as a simple implementation of uh, C++. Uh, it only, it only uh, exposes most of the C++ API, but not all of it. So some of it you'd have to like, re-implement yourself if you actually really need it. But that's more of the obscure things. Um, and it's targeted to look like the language it's, being, like, it's, it's targeting. So it, it looks like Python. It makes it supposed to be very simple implementation. Um, so when should you use these? When, what are the bottlenecks? Usually this is like large data processing, your business layer that is a little bit more complex. Uh, and then um, when you have like, when something that scales like linearly or exponentially with large data and you're dealing with large data, you want to like speed up the process. Like Thibault mentioned, sometimes you know, you're doing billions of requests or millions of requests a day and you want to be able to like not burn CPU running Python on something very complicated. Um, so let's, com let, let's continue with the example from before. Let's say you have a, 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 from the templating discussion we talked about a schedule. So let's say you have the schedule for this convention. Uh, on the left here, you have an API. It's written in Proto. I don't know. Uh, I work at Google, so Protobuf is kind of what I do all day. <laughs> uh, so Protobuffer is a way, to, sorry, it's a way of describing an API that serializes across languages. And here on the left, you have some sort of uh, API that provides like all the room schedules. Imagine every room had an event schedule. So this is kind of what it would look like. You have all, a list of all the rooms. The rooms have a room number and a number of schedules assigned to them. Uh, and each of them have a start time, an end time, and a name for the event. And then your API needs to like, return something more that looks like a calendar. So you convert one side of the data to the other, where you're just like, kind of pulling out the days, calculating duration, doing some, some, data, some date parsing. Uh, and so you want to like, your, your target API is the one on the right, start with the one on the left. Um, so here's kind of the example of what the date, like, what it would look like. Again, nothing super complicated, but you, you are doing some string processing, some, you're, like, you know, you're building some strings, you're doing date processing, 
and stuff that can really add up if we're building a really big convention, like a really big convention, like a thousand rooms, maybe 10,000 rooms. And this is only mainly to just kind of emphasize that like sometimes data can get really big. And for the purposes of this example, I went with like a very naive implementation of how this like conversion would work. You know, I built it both in Python and C++. And we wanted to see how fast like Python. So it gets pretty slow. Uh, with uh, I think with 10,000, it gets up to like 40 seconds during the conversion. Um, and that's not really acceptable, uh, especially if this is like kind of like the, this is just like a linear implementation. If there was something more exponential, like tree traversal, well, we would have probably bigger problems. So using Cliff, we can kind of subvert some of these issues by building the same function we did in Python, which is like a very simple, just like transformation, uh, and then call it from Cliff, sorry, call it through Cliff from C++, as follows, you define the, on the left of here, you import your header, uh, which is your C++ header that has, should have a similar method signature to your Python one. Uh, you define the name of the function in C++, your target uh, function name in Python, and then you pass over the, 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 what you call it, the parameters with the types that C++ expects, and here we're just returning a void, so it's just a status okay. Uh, and then calling it looks very simple. Uh, you just import your, uh, your Cliff Benchmark C, which is like the C implementation, and then you can optionally get to choose to call the Python one or the C one. And then from the point of view of the developer or anyone else working on the code base, it looks like a nat native Python call. And then so the results are it's seven times faster. And this is just a very simple like data mutation. You could do this for more complicated work, and it really does offer you the ability to drop into C++ when you really need it and then fall back to using Python when you like do most of your day-to-day -day work. Um, there are a few pitfalls in this. This is just for the fact that I did work with protos. Make sure that you sh share the memories between C++ and Python so that you're using the same proto. You don't want to do that, like, that serialization back and forth all the time, which can be very expensive. Um, and kind of the takeaway from this presentation is that a lot of us here, especially you come to a Python convention, is that you're working in Python. Python is like a great language, it's very powerful. Your developers are much happier when you work in Python, and it lets you like iterate and build things much more easily. But if you come to, to a place where it's like it's becoming non-performant and you're having issues trying to manage performance, I think identifying like key bottlenecks and falling back to C++ for those instead of re-architecting your whole system or doing a massive migration is kind of like a really like beneficial thing to have. And um, you know, you can try out Cliff. It's a uh, GitHub. GitHub, I think, slash uh, Cliff, and it's open source, so you guys can give it a shot. Any questions? Okay. Nope. What if I Python code originally used dictionaries, especially huge dictionaries? When I start using converting some bits of code into C++, the native C++ dictionary has worse performance characteristics. <coughs> How do you deal with that? What, what kind of dictionary do you use for the C++ part? Can you repeat? Yeah, so the question was about using Python dictionaries, the large ones, uh, and then calling those into C++ and like the performance characteristics of crossing the boundary with a dictionary. Uh, the way Cliff does this is you'll define a struct, which you can actually define directly in the, in the configuration that maps the, the, what the dictionary object has like the, the, to actual types, like a struct that has real types for those dictionaries. And then when you pass it over, it would automatically get converted to that, to that struct, as long as the, the types match up and there's no like errors. And uh, then you, you'll be using a native like C++ struct. It wouldn't be a Py object or a Py dictionary, it would be an actual C++ struct. So you'd have all the performance characteristics of structs. Any other questions? Yes? So I haven't really used Cypher much except tinkering with it, but how do, uh, in a system like this, how do they handle com more complex data types? Like C++ does not handle that, right? So if I have a complex object and I pass <coughs> it to a function. Uh, yeah, so there is, yeah, that, is, that can get a little bit tricky. Uh, the, the way you would do it is like defining a lot of structs, defining a lot of, like you have to define it in both places. Like a good example here, I was using protobuf just to kind of simplify it, but 
Protobuf makes this very easy because it allows you to have one API that it can be used in multiple languages. Uh, if you wanted to use Cython, oh sorry, not Cython, Cliff, you would either define that very complicated data structure in both C++ and Python and then have a, a mapping in Cliff, or you could just like kind of isolate just one small function or something that is very expensive and only like called out to it when necessary. Um, the thing with Cliff is that it has a very low overhead so you could use, be, have a pretty chatty API with it and it's pretty okay. Like there's not a lot of like, I had to calling it. It's usually more beneficial to have like one, like a function being constantly called in Cliff as opposed to maybe building a more complicated data structure. Anything else?